I'm Tom Seafried, professor of biology at Boston College in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. I'll be presenting information today describing cancer as a metabolic disease and then discuss the implications that this information has for the development of novel cancer therapies. I like to start my <clears throat> presentations with an overview of the current cancer crisis so that we can get a full appreciation of the challenges that we have. So this, this, this uh, chart, data from the American Cancer Society, shows the number of new cases, deaths per year and deaths per day from 2013 to, to estimated uh, information from 2020. So as you can see, there is a significant increase in the number of new cases over the years. And there was about a 4.3% increase in the number of deaths from cancer in the United States per year and over 1,600 people a day dying from cancer um, uh, each, each day during these, during these periods. This, th this is rather depressing and concerning information in stating that we have made little, if any, major progress in reducing cancer deaths over this period. So one has to ask the question, you know, what is largely responsible for the failure to manage, uh, to prevent or manage cancer. And in my mind, it has to do with the uh, view of how we understand cancer. Is cancer a nuclear genetic disease or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease? And I'll be discussing information that shows that cancer is primarily a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And what's shown here is a picture of a cartoon of a cell pointing out two of the critical organelles, the mitochondrion and the nucleus. I will be presenting evidence that it is the mitochondrial damage to oxidative phosphorylation that ultimately leads to the mutations in the nucleus, and that the mutations in the nucleus are downstream arise as downstream epiphenomenon of the damage to the mitochondria. The, org the origin of cellular energy in the cell. And as you can see, these little bean-shaped organelles are the mitochondria, and the little squiggly, squiggly material inside are cristae. And they are responsible for the generation of energy through oxidative phosphorylation. Now, we have had major scientific theories help explain the phenomenon of nature over, uh, over centuries. And a theory is uh, is simply an attempt to explain the facts of nature. Reality is based on the replicated facts repeated by numbers of, of scientists and, and laboratories, whereas the interpretation of the facts is based on the theory to explain this. We know from past studies, the heliocentric theory could explain better the movements of the celestial bodies than could the geocentric theory. The Catholic Church held for centuries along with Aristotle and others, that the earth was the center of the solar system. It was the work of, of Copernicus and Galileo that showed that it was in fact the sun, overturning this uh, worldview uh, on the origin of the solar system and the universe. The germ theory could explain better the origin of contagious diseases than could the miasma or bad air theory. It was Louis Pasteur who pr proposed that cancer was caused, or cancer diseases, I should say, were caused by invisible microbes. Pasteur took a lot of, uh, of, of grief and uh, challenge in his, in his concepts, but it was eventually proven that he was correct. The theory of evolution, the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution by natural selection, could better explain the origin of species on this planet than could the theory of special creation. What I'll be addressing today is, can the mitochondrial metabolic theory explain better the facts of cancer than can the somatic mutation theory, the dominant theory today? So the current dogma about cancer is that cancer is a genetic disease. And this paper published by Doug Hanahan and Robert Weinberg, Hallmarks of Cancer, the Next Generation, is one of the most highly cited papers in all of the, in all of the field of biology. The take-home message is that cancer, ca cancer cells carry the oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations 
that define cancer as a genetic disease. This dogmatic view of the nature of cancer is present in all major textbooks of biology, biochemistry, and cell biology. It's also the message that you see on the uh, website from the National Cancer Institute. Cancer is a genetic disease. There's no other, dis there's no other discussion of alternative views. So this, this dogmatic view has indoctrinated several generations of physicians and scientists into the view that cancer is caused by somatic mutations. The somatic mutation theory is the basis for the view that cancer is a genetic disease. Mutations in genes that inhibit or stimulate cell division contribute to cancer. So we have mutations in tumor suppressor genes that fail to suppress division out of control. And we have mutations in proto-oncogenes that stimulate cells to divide out of control. The phenotype of cancer is cell division out of control. So this is the definition, cell division out of control, driven by uh, defects in suppressor genes and in proto-oncogenes. The somatic mute theory uh, uh, argues that it is the accumulation of random mutations that causes the development of a cancer cell. So normal cells suffer a series of uh, random mutations. No one's sure how many. This, this uh, cartoon shows four. And the normal growth control cell eventually enters into a mesenchymal malignant cell. And this malignant cell will then grow out of control and possibly spread throughout the body. And here's a quote from Dr. Vogelstein, one of the leading scientists supporting the gene theory of cancer, stating, we now know precisely what causes cancer, a sequential series of alterations in well-known driver genes. So these driver genes are considered the most important genes for driving the development of cells out of control. And the result of our uh, uh, work in studying cancer as a genetic disease is the development of personalized therapy or what we call precision medicine. And this woman is looking at a screen of breast cancer cells to see if they possess extra copies of a particular gene. And this information may, then may play a role in prognosis or diagnosis or so, something like this. Now, this would be certainly very, very important if in fact these mutations were in fact related to the origin of the disease. And as I will show you, they're downstream epiphenomenon and have uh, mostly have little if any relevance to the nature of cancer. The other problem is to get information like this, biopsy material is necessary. So tissue from patients must be taken and examined for these genetic changes. In the very process of taking the biopsy material, you disturb the, the cancer cell microenvironment, the cellular microenvironment, which leads to a risk of spreading the cancer. So you're getting information that may be irrelevant and putting the patient at risk by getting this information. Now let's look at evidence that challenges the somatic mutation theory. Anytime evidence comes along that challenges a major entrenched concept, oftentimes those that work in the field, they don't want to look at this information. They don't want to speak about it. They don't want to hear about it. Basically, they want to ignore it. So let's look at the evidence that challenges the somatic mutation theory. The origin originator of the theory was the Theodore Bovary in 1914. He actually uh, was the first to suggest the possibility that defects in a cell nucleus might be responsible for the origin of cancer. However, he was an extremely apologetic about his conclusions, and he, he clearly stated he knew nothing about cancer, never studied cancer, and that his essay was purely a speculative discussion. Yet he was made out to be the person who originated the theory of cancer as a genetic disease. There's now accumulating evidence showing that, that different types of cancers have no mutations. Even deep se sequencing analysis of certain malignant cancer types was unable to identify genes that could be attributed to cancer. There were no mutations in some cancers, hard to explain. New information is showing that cancer driver genes are found in normal cells. In other words, normal cells in normal tissues express mutations in the so-called key genes that are supposed to drive the disease. How is it possible 
that normal cells could have cancer driver disease and not develop cancer? How is it possible that cancer, some raging cancers have no mutations? The somatic mutation theory has not explained or discussed this at all. There's also carcinogens that we know about that do not cause mutations, such as asbestos and some other uh, carcinogens that are not associated with the development uh, of cancer. Also, we have to consider the rarity of cancer in our closest primate relatives, the chimpanzees and gorillas. These are, cancer is extremely rare in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are about 99% similar to us in form of protein and, and, and gene sequencing. Yet cancer is extremely rare. Indeed, there has never been a documented case of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee. Yet 46,000 um, uh, uh, women in, this in the United States die from breast cancer each year. How is this possible? It, it's linked to diet and lifestyle issues. There is a non-mutagenic origin of metastatic cancer, met met metastatic behavior not having linked to any mutagenic origin. There are off-target effects of these so-called ca cancer precision drugs that are made to precisely target specific genes that are involved, yet the off-target effects are quite debilitating and life-threatening. This should not happen if these drugs are precise. Finally, the nuclear transfer, mitochondrial transfer experiments provide the strongest evidence to argue against the origin of cancer as a genetic disease. And what I have done is published this paper, Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease, in the journal Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology. And I encourage everyone to read this paper very carefully because it presents large amounts of data that specifically argue against the gene theory of cancer and in support of the mitochondrial metabolic uh, origin of the disease. And this slide, this cartoon simply summarizes the vast numbers of experiments that were presented in the paper. So what we have here are normal cells, and these normal cells contain a normal integrated nuclear genome, and they also have normal mitochondria in the cytoplasm so that they can regulate their physiology quite, quite normally, both energetically and genetically. And they beget normal cells. Now the red cells are tumor cells, and tumor cells beget other tumor cells, Tumor cells have many gene mutations in the nucleus, but they also have defects in the cytoplasm, in the mitochondria, lacking cristae or having other abnormalities. Now, is it the mutations in the nucleus that causes cancer, or is it the defects in the mitochondria of the cytoplasm that causes the cancer? These experiments were addressed quite clearly by nuclear and mitochondrial transfer experiments. So the nucleus of the tumor cell is then placed in the cytoplasm of a normal cell. And what was found is that you got that there, there were normal cells produced, sometimes normal tissues, and sometimes a mouse or a frog cloned from the nucleus of a tumor cell, but these organisms showed no cancer. On the other hand, the nucleus of the normal cell was placed in the cytoplasm of the tumor cell. And rather than forming tumor cells, or, or the, uh, rather than um, forming normal cells, they continue to produce either dead cells or tumor cells. These results are the exact opposite of the results predicted by the somatic mutation theory of cancer, which should have said that the origin resides in the nucleus. These should have formed tumors, and these should have not formed tumors. Also, when normal mitochondria are transplanted to cancer cells, you get no tumors. You can suppress the, 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 the development of the tumor. These findings viewed together provide the strongest evidence to date that cancer cannot be a disease of somatic mutations in the nucleus. This information, together with the previous information that I just presented, provides overwhelming evidence that the disease cannot be a genetic disease. So if somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer, how do we get cancer? This was described originally by the work of Otto Warburg back in the, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Cancers arise from the damage to cellular respiration. Energy through fermentation gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. And cancer cells continue to ferment lactic acid in the presence of oxygen, and this is referred to as the Warburg effect. Cells should not continue to 
produce fermentation when oxygen is present, they should shift back to oxidative phosphorylation. The new, the new findings that myself and Dr. Shinopoulos from Semmelweis University in Budapest, we found, and we found the missing link in Warburg's central theory, and that is cancer cells can also ferment succinic acid derived from glutamine. Glutamine derives succinic acid, and we call this the Q effect to make it different, to make, distinguish it from the Warburg effect. Q is the single letter for glutamine. It's the missing link that Warburg did not know about, but can now explain the majority of observations in cancer. So enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic malady of all or most cancer cells. So if each cancer cell has a different genetic signature, in other words, all the cells in the tumor have different genetic mutations, but all the cells in the tumor have one common phenotype, that is they ferment, then it makes sense to target the common phenotype than to chase after the genes which are different in every single cancer cell. So what we have defined in our, in our this is the, the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, or the citric acid cycle. And we all memorize, or we have to know about this, it's in the matrix of the mitochondria. And we now know that this step that in normal cells produces very little ATP, in the cancer cell produces large amounts of ATP through a process of mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. This is a substrate level phosphorylation step. And now we have defined this as the origin of most of the energy in the cancer cell. And this shows mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, the missing link in the metabolic theory. And we just recently published this paper in ASN Neuro. And it's in the glutaminolysis pathway. So glutamine to glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA to succinate. So this enzymatic is a substrate level phosphorylation in the mitochondria, and it generates a large amount of ATP. So the ATP then is coming from a different site in the mitochondria. Than it in the cancer mitochondria than it does in the uh, normal mitochondria. And this is a, an example of what these mitochondria look like in cancer cells. And this is a glioblastoma, very aggressive brain cancer. But here's the normal mitochondria. And these stripes uh, are the cristae. And they contain the proteins, lipids, and, and enzymes that allow cells to generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. So the cancer mitochondria in this glioblastoma has crystallysis. The cristae are missing. And in biology, we have a, a major tenant um, that structure determines function. And if the structure of the organelle is abnormal, the function of the, of the organelle will be abnormal. If the parts of the organelle responsible for oxidative phosphorylation are missing, the organelle will be unable to generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. This is direct evidence indicating that the structure of the organelle is abnormal in this tumor cell, in these kinds of tumors, glioblastoma. But we also see the same phenomenon in the, in the mitochondria of all kinds of cancers. Here's breast cancer and colorectal cancer. And here you can see the tumor cells with vacuoles and disorganized cristae compared to normal. And here you can see in the colorectal mitochondria that have no cristae. Structure determines function. We have found these mitochondrial abnormalities in all types of major cancers, bladder cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancers, uh, brain cancers. Um, uh, all the major types of cancers have, have, we have seen the same structural abnormalities, others on, my, on ultrastructure analysis. Now, the results of this will alter the, the energy metabolism in the cells. So if we look at energy metabolism in normal cells, we see that the bulk of energy comes from oxidative phosphorylation with the waste products of CO2 and water. So glucose is metabolized in the glycolytic pathway to pyruvate. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria and the Krebs cycle is fully oxidized and generates this energy through the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Very little energy is coming out of the cytoplasm in glycolysis or out of the Krebs cycle that I showed you before in normal cells. These are called substrate level phosphorylations. They can work in the presence or absence of, of oxygen. You have to realize that energy is the key necessity for life. Without energy, nothing can grow. So it's very important to know where the energy comes from. Now, this is the cancer cell. 
energy is coming from totally different places, the majority of energy. So we get, cancer cell gets very little energy from oxidative phosphorylation because the cristae and the mitochondria are abnormal, as I've just shown you. But this cell still remains alive because it generates energy in the cytoplasm with lactic acid as a waste product, which is the Warburg effect, or succinic acid as a waste product coming from the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle and glycolysis generate the majority of energy through substrate level phosphorylation, a non-oxidative process, where much less energy now comes from, a, from uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the key shift. The cancer cell is generating energy through different processes. So the question now, how, how does this relate to dysregulated cell growth? How does this disturbed energy metabolism link to the hallmarks of the disease? And this is what we've been able to show. We've been able to reconfigure the landscape of understanding cancer by placing the focus on the origin for this organelle, the mitochondria. So we know, and this was the concept of the oncogenic paradox that plagued and puzzled the field, even to this day, you'll read and see many examples where people simply don't understand how all the provocative agents that have been linked to the origin of cancer could cause the disease through a common pathophysiological mechanism. Carcinogens cause cancer. We know that. Uh, that's why they're called carcinogens. They cause cancer. Carcinogens damage, enter the mitochondria, and damages oxphos. Radiation can damage oxidative phosphorylation, leading to the origin of cancer. Intermittent hypoxia damages mitochondria, leading to the origin of cancer. Inflammation can damage mitochondrial function. Chronic inflammation is a known risk factor for the development of cancer. Rare inherited mutations like the BRCA1 and the leaf many mutations that people recognize, they operate by damaging mitochondria. The RAS oncogene is known to be a facilitator of cancer. It damages mitochondria. Viruses, we know of many different kinds of viruses, the papillomavirus, hepatitis C virus. Viruses can cause cancer because they either the virus themselves or the products of the virus damage the mitochondria. And of course, aging. A cancer is higher in older people than younger people. Age damages by just living on the planet. Age will damage mitochondria. Now, all of this mitochondrial damage leads to the reactive uh, uh, generation of ROS, which are reactive oxygen species. The reaction oxygen species damage the nuclear genome, lipids and proteins in the cell. So the mutations that we see in cancer come as the result of damage from reactive oxygen species. The mutations are an effect. They are not the cause of cancer. So the majority of, uh, uh, of studies on cancer have really been focusing on downstream epiphenomena, where the real origin of the disease is related to the, the function of the mitochondria. Now, interestingly enough, the RAS, the RAS also damage oxidative phosphorylation, OxFos. The mitochondria uh, cell send a signal to the nucleus that, that the organelle is incapable of providing enough energy to maintain the life of the cell. This signaling system then turns on genes in the nucleus that upregulate substrate level phosphorylation, like HIF1-alpha and MYC. So in order to run substrate level phosphorylation, you need fermentable fuels, and the fermentable fuels are glucose and glutamine. So the mitochondria signals the nucleus the nucleus begins to upregulate uh, uh, pathways, uh, transporters to bring in glucose and glutamine through an en generating energy through substrate level phosphorylation, while the mitochondria continue to suffer damage and gradually lose their ability to produce energy through oxphos. It is this transition from oxidative phosphorylation to substrate level phosphorylation that ultimately leads to the development of dysregulated cell growth. So we can then link the hallmarks of cancer as defined by Hanahan and Weinberg directly back to damage to the respiration and energy transition in the cell. So the first three hallmarks, self-sufficiency, insensitivity to anti-growth, and limitless replicative potential is the result of the cell 
falling back on its default state. And the default state of mammalian cells is proliferation. And proliferation was the phenotype of all cells and organisms on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere some 2.5 billion years ago. So the cancer cell is falling back on ancient pathways that lead to unbridled proliferation as all cells did before oxygen came into the, into the atmosphere. This also leads to blood vessel development in the cancer cells, which is angiogenesis in the, in the micro environment of the cancer cell, I should say, also leads to evasion of apoptosis or programmed cell death. Why is this cancer cell bypassing the natural ability to, to die when energy metabolism is so shifted? Because the mitochondria control apoptosis. The mitochondria act as the kill switch. If the kill switch is broken, the cell will bypass its, its programmed cell death uh, mechanism and therefore go on to, to, um, to uh, proliferate. Now, the key question is metastasis, which is ultimately responsible for the death of 90% of cancer patients. How do you link metastasis to uh, disturbed energy metabolism? First, we need to look at the metastatic cascade. So the metacas metastatic cascade is a stereotypical series of events that underlie uh, the origin from any tissue, breast cancer, colon cancer, you know, bladder cancer, all these different cancers to spread around the body go through the same cascade. First, there is a local invasion. So here are the green cells represented as the cancer cells. They become uh, metabolically destabilized, enter their default state of proliferation, and eventually break through the basement membrane and enter into the local tissue. Intravisation. Now, some of these cells have the ability to enter into the blood vessels and then um, uh, um, uh, avoid the immune system and actually suppress the immune system. So su survival and Im immunosuppressive effects. They also move through the bloodstream and extravasate, leave the bloodstream and form tumors in distant organs. And that's ultimately what we call cancer spread or metastasis. So a question is, how can the accumulation of random somatic mutations cause a non-random metastatic cascade based on the epithelial mesenchymal transition, which I haven't talked about, but this is the basis for cancer metastasis based on the somatic mutation theory. It makes no sense. So the question is, how, 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 do, all, how do we explain all of this based on the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer? So it, it is linked to the, uh, uh, the macrophage fusion hypothesis. Macrophages, these red cells, are actually uh, guardians of our body. They're wound healing cells. They patrol our enti entire body. They enter and exit bloodstream. They, they, they work with the immune system. They are part of the immune system. So when we have an incipient, here's normal epithelial cells. Many cancers arise from epithelial cells. So they become destabilized by any one of the provocative agents. They have destabilized energy metabolism. They're entering their default state, but they are not capable of spreading around the body. Our immune cells come into this micro environment, recognizing cancer as an unhealed wound, and they begin to throw out growth factors and cytokines, which is like putting gasoline on the fire. It stimulates these incipient cancer cells to grow even more, even more disorganized and dysregulated. The immune cells it will fuse to put out the, the uh, heal the wound. They'll either fuse together or fuse with the cancer, these incipient cancer cells, thereby diluting the cytoplasm with abnormal mitochondria. Now what you have is these uh, rogue macrophages, former immune cells. They are already genetically programmed to spread throughout the body because this is what they do in their normal function. But now they are metabolically destabilized with a genetic architecture to spread around the body. And that's what they do. They intravisate and they suppress the immune system and they are the tumor cells that will be the most deadly. And they are heavily dependent on glutamine and glucose for their survival. So recognizing that all cancer cells require glutamine and glucose, especially the metastatic cells. So if most cancer cells obtain energy through fermentation, then what therapies might we 
be effective in managing and preventing the tumors? Well, one strategy is to reduce levels of fermentable fuels while elevating levels of non-fermentable fuels. And this is a simple diagram illustrating how we begin to shift levels of the fermentable fuel glucose and replacing glucose with the non-fermentable fuel ketone bodies, which are derived from the mobilization of fats in the liver. So the liver makes ketone bodies out of mobilized fats. So blood sugar must be lowered because the cancer cells thrive on fermentable uh, glucose. So glucose is fermented to lactic acid. So in order to stop that process, it is important to lower blood sugar levels. But, but we're taking away a fuel, right? So you have to replace one fuel with another fuel. So we increase ketone bodies. Ketone bodies have to be respired in normal mitochondria. If the mitochondria are defective, they can't use ketone bodies for energy. Only normal cells with normal mitochondria can use the ketone bodies for energy. So when people say cancer cells can burn ketone bodies, no, they can't then they would have to argue against all of the structural defects that I just showed you on the structure function in the mitochondria. Mitochondria of cancer cells cannot burn ketones. As a matter of fact, ketones are absolutely toxic to many cancer cells. So we developed the glucose ketone index calculator, which is a simple tool to monitor therapeutic efficacy and the metabolic management, not only of brain cancer, because we now know that all cancers suffer a similar, similar problem. So this tool can be used to, to, to help uh, uh, monitor therapies for all types, types of cancer. And basically, it's the ratio of glucose in millimolars to ketone bodies in millimolar, and you get this GKI, glucose ketone index. And we showed with others that therapeutic efficacy is considered best with index ratios approaching 1.0 or below. And I'll discuss it can be challenging to get to these ratios, but it's these ratios that will be effective uh, in managing all types uh, of cancer. Now, we adopted this glucose ketone index into a more global approach to cancer management called the press pulse therapy using two different strategies, a chronic press that puts stress on on the cancer cell metabolism, and then acute pulses, specific, specifically drugs and procedures that will in interact sy synergistically, will work synergistically with press therapies. So essentially, with the goal is to uh, gradually move uh, the patient from a state of disease to a state of health by strategically targeting tumor cells while enhancing the health and vitality of normal cells, a very different strategy than is what is currently done. So certain press therapies include ketogenic metabolic therapy using restricted ketogenic diets and ketone supplements, stress management, emotional stress contributes, anxiety contributes to elevated blood sugar. So we do, we do uh, stress management therapies to lower anxiety and blood sugar through corticosteroid elevation, we reduce corticosteroid elevation. And then we use certain drugs and procedures that work to target availability of glucose and glutamine, working together with the press therapy. And gradually the cancer is degraded slowly and uh, the patient will emerge from the treatment healthier than when they started. The key goal here is to, is to degrade and kill tumor cells without harming the body and even enhancing the health and vitality uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the overall body. Now, this is a paper that we recently published in a preclinical system for glioblastoma outlining how press pulse works to manage aggressive uh, 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 brain cancer, me me uh, malignant brain cancer. And we combined a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, that is ketogenic metabolic um, uh, therapy, together with a glucose targeting drug called Don, 6-dioxynorglucine. Uh, uh, this is a, a drug that looks like glutamine but cannot be metabolized. And this strategic uh, synergistic interaction was able to significantly kill and wipe out these brain cancer cells while improving overall survival and quality of life. Now, this is great. The, the concepts are built on the preclinical system, and we also then use this to treat a patient, this same concept, uh, press pulse metabolic strategy, to treat a young man with glioblastoma uh, from Egypt. The patient was doing remarkably well. Unfortunately, we had to use standard of care, which involved radiation and chemotherapy, uh, but he survived most of that quite well using the press pulse metabolic therapy. 
uh, and we published this paper after two years, the patient was doing very, very well. But unfortunately, the patient expired at 30 months of age, um, dying rel relatively quickly uh, at 30 months. And uh, an autopsy biopsy material was taken. And it turned out that the patient had died not from the tumor, but from the damaged radiation necrosis. The, the radiation that was used as part of the standard of care was, def was described as being responsible for the demise of this patient. Now, based on this and much, many other, uh, much other information, we published this paper, uh, a provocative question. Should ketogenic metabolic therapy become the standard of care for glioblastoma? And what we did here is we outlined in no uncertain terms how the current use of radiation and chemo is largely responsible for facilitating the recurrence and growth and demise of the majority of brain cancer patients. So it's the therapy itself that's putting these poor patients at risk for early and rapid death. So it is my opinion that replacement of standard of care with ketogenic metabolic therapy will not only improve progression-free and overall survival, but, but also help these patients to uh, overcome their disease in, 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 in a less, far less toxic way. And we think this will be the future. This has to be the future because the current system is not working. Now, this is a paper that recently came out showing how press pulse metabolic therapy could, could uh, manage a highly metastatic thioma in a woman. No radiation, no chemo, uh, no standard of care, but only metabolic therapy. These, these papers uh, pre uh, present um, the rationale uh, for why uh, the approach to metabolic therapy uh, should be considered for the management of cancer. And this is another paper that we recently published uh, uh, using ketogenic metabolic therapy, how, how that would work as a complementary or alternative approach to managing breast cancer. And we think the majority of breast cancer patients, uh, whether triple negative or what, what class they have, because all cancers suffer the same metabolic malady, that they would respond remarkably well to ketogenic metabolic therapy as an alternative or even complementary approach to standards of care. So, and this is the paper where we also showed, outlined how biopsy, taking biopsy tissue from the breast can put the patient at risk for spreading the cancer. In other words, making it much worse. So why are we taking the biopsy material? To do gene profiles, to see what kind, of, when the genes are, are largely irrelevant to the disease. So we, we've outlined that ketogenic metabolic therapy could be the best approach for managing not only breast cancer, but by all cancers because of the underlying uh, origin of the disease. So in conclusion, most if not all cancers are a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease. Cancer is not a genetic disease as been widely considered. And it is my view that this misunderstanding of cancer as a genetic disease is largely responsible for the failure to reduce death rates from cancer. So until this changes, I don't see much progress happening. A reliance on substrate level phosphorylation for energy is the metabolic hallmark of most, if not all cancers. Therefore, based on that knowledge, the simultaneous restriction of glucose and glutamine can help manage most cancers. The press pulse metabolic therapy is a non-toxic cost-effective strategy for the possible management of most cancers. And eventually this press pulse therapy will replace these toxic and ineffective standards of care. I'd like to thank, uh, recognize the various, the large numbers of people that have worked uh, with us over the years to develop the concepts that I've presented. And moving forward, we hope to develop a global society for metabolic therapy where we can, we can replace current toxic standards of care with um, more rational, more, under, more less uh, cost-effective and less toxic strategies to improve overall survival and progression-free survival. And finally, I'd like to thank those who support our research, especially the Foundation for Metabolic Cancer Therapy set up by Travis Christofferson. And if those would, you know, we, we, we need support for our research and, and the, this, these foundations and groups have been very helpful in keeping our research program going so that we can develop the concepts further uh, that I've mentioned in this talk. The George U Foundation, Dr. Joseph Maroon, 
uh, Mr. Edward Miller, the Kenneth Rainin Foundation, the CrossFit Organization, Boston College Research Fund, Children with Cancer, United Kingdom, and the NIH. And thank you for your attention. Thomas C. Fred, as always, uh, fascinating, pretty heavy going at times, but uh, really interesting stuff. And, it, and as he says, it's all about the, uh, it's not the nucleus, it's the cytoplasm, it's the mitochondria. Yeah, I mean, look, I have to say, uh, I was absolutely amazed the first time I saw Thomas present. Um, it's absolutely brilliant stuff. And anybody who hasn't seen him, um, I always encourage them to have a look at what he's saying. And I think he really has a revelation for both you and I. When we're in medical school, we've been taught that cancer is a genetic disease. And he presents so lucidly all the, the science that disproves this. And I mean, so just quite simply, inside our, inside our cells, we carry our genetic material in something called the nucleus. That's where our DNA is. And outside the nucleus, we have the this cytoplasm or the fluid of the cell, and that's where we have these little things called mitochondria, which are commonly known as the powerhouses of cell. And mitochondria are basically where energy is produced. If we're looking at a metabolic disease, almost certainly it's going to be involving the mitochondria. And I was just fascinated at the experiments he described, where they had cancerous cells, and they were able to transfer the nucleus which contains all the genetic information into another cell. And they found that those cells that received this damaged DNA did not develop cancer. And yet, when they did the same thing, when they took the fluid containing the mitochondria from cancer-affected cells and they transferred that to other cells, they did transfer the cancer. I mean, I just think this is an incredibly powerful piece of evidence that perhaps we've got it totally wrong, that it's not a genetic disease, that we do have genetic mutations, but as Thomas says, they're downstream effects from the, from the metabolic dysfunction. So metabolic dysfunction in and of itself can lead to an increase in um, oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, so on and so forth, and they are what can cause this random genetic damage that we often see, and I say often but not always see, in cancer cells. I mean, this, I don't know if I'm being over the top, it's worthy of a Nobel Prize. I had the same thought, and why isn't that experiment universally uh, praised and universally recognised? Well, it's not even just one experiment. It's a whole series of experiments um, that he's put together so elegantly that all show the same thing. So the question is, as, uh, as Thomas raised, I mean, how could we change people's minds? People have, uh, you know, everything you're taught in medical school, you still believe, and people are so reluctant to uh, to open their their ears and eyes to uh, to new ideas. So the challenge is is something that seems very obvious there's good scientific evidence and yet there's a reluctance from the medical profession to change their entrenched ideas which is a quite a real sort of criticism i think of our profession oh absolutely i've actually spoken to people who work in oncology about this and there there are some uh, some allowances that diet perhaps can be involved and metabolism might be involved but not not enough to actually change the the central paradigm of treatment. We know, you know, we're both sports and exercise medicine physicians. We know that people who exercise can have something along the size of a 30% reduction in all cause mortality if they have cancer. We know that obesity, metabolic ill health, is independently associated with at least 13 different types of cancers. We know there's a metabolic element, and yet we just seem to be ignoring what's staring us in our face. And we just need, need more people like Tom to spread the word. I, uh, I, I can't wait for the day when this hopefully becomes the accepted theory of cancer.